We are about to take a deep dive into the manning and loading procedures for the ship's 14-inch guns that takes more than 20 minutes. So pull your geek hat down around your ears if you want to stick around. One other thing, being an unventilated gun turret when the temperatures are in the upper 80s is like hanging out in the attic for a couple of hours. You'll see me in full sweat mode, but don't worry, this was planned for and no narrators were injured during the production. There were four quarts of Gatorade and even ice packs never more than 30 feet and a very short ladder climb away. So we're about to take you inside of one of the big 14-inch gun turrets on Battleship Texas. Before we do, I just want to point out this is the first time and possibly the only time you'll see me on camera because this, my videos are about the ship, not about me. But yes, as you can tell by looking at me, I'm an old fat guy, but hopefully that won't get too much in the way. Now, this is a 14-inch gun turret, two guns. It's a Mark I turret, meaning it was the first of the 14-inch gun turret designs. This is a great thing to see because this shows you what the earliest evolution uh, step was. And then, of course, by the time the eye was come along, tremendous progress had been made in, in both machinery and basic design. But the, from this, you, you'll be able to get a good starting point and see how we started out with essentially what was a, an almost 19th century design. Now we're about to go inside and we'll take a look around not only at how these uh, turrets were manned, but also how they, the crew worked together to load and fire one of the guns. This is a basic layout for left-hand gun sleeves in the turrets. Right-hand sleeves are identical, but their layouts are reversed. We will be visiting sleeves in turrets 1 and 2 in order to take advantage of some differences in artifacts and their configurations. As you can see, there were seven positions in the actual gun house. There were also two men below in a gun well and two more in what was called the side pocket where powder was transferred from the dividing room to the gun well. Now the first position that we'll talk about is the plug man. It is his uh, job to basically to operate the breech plug and also deprime and prime uh, the uh, gun to make it ready for firing. So we're just going to walk forward uh, beside the outboard side of the gun breech and let's take a look down through this deck opening. There were two unseen crew members that were part of the actual gunnery crew in the turret. They were located in this uh, very small compartment that was called either the bin or the side pocket. It was in here that two crew members uh, took powder through that closed scuttle that's in the deck from the dividing room. And they placed four bags on this aluminum tray uh, here. Actually, there's room for three bags. so. Uh, it would appear that they just brought one bag up and would leave it on the deck until they had room for it. Then uh, the uh, what were called the well men or the powder passers located beneath the gun when they were ready for powder would open the powder scuttle through that bulkhead and they would receive the four bags of powder. As you can see it's a pretty cramped space and the hatch that we're looking through would have remained closed whenever the gun was in action so you couldn't suffer from claustrophobia if you were going to work in here. Uh, I am currently standing in what's called the number one loader position, uh, sometimes also called Powder Man 1, but perhaps most importantly, this position also served as the gun captain. He was uh, uh, in charge of the entire operation within this particular gun sleeve, and most importantly, certainly in charge of the safety. And from this position, he could see absolutely everything that was of critical importance. He could look up into the gun bore, in fact, it was his job to make sure that the board was cleared uh, whenever the breach was open. He also then could look around and see every position, make sure that uh, people were doing what they were supposed to be doing in exactly the right order. Okay, we're in the number two loader position here. It was his job to assist the uh, number one loader uh, to hoisting powder bags up to load into the breach, but he also assisted the plug man who operated the breech plug. We're still in the gun house, but uh, below it is what's called the gun pit. I think for obvious reasons, since uh, here's the uh, gun itself and the uh, gun deck for the gun house. 
There were two uh, crew members that stayed in here that were part of the gunnery crew. They were either called well men number one or two, or they were also called powder men three and four. They were positioned in here, and whenever bore clear was called by the gun captain, they would open this uh, powder scuttle that's right now in the open position, and the powder bags would be pushed out from the, uh, from the bin that I had just pointed out. And from here then the powder bags would be passed up. But we'll talk about that later when we get into procedures. Now I'm now standing in the hoist man, also sometimes called the number one shell man's position. He's on a rather precarious ledge uh, and he was standing right next to the uh, first loader or the gun captain. Now, in fact, he, also, he even had a safety strap that was used to strap him in so that he could stay in position. It was his job to order uh, shells up from the uh, shell deck located below. He would use this uh, uh, telegraph here and would signal either lower or hoist. So as, a shell, he, as he uh, uh, ordered hoist, a shell would come up. It was sitting on what's called a shell car and a cradle that swiveled within that. When the shell came up, it tipped backwards through the hoist to where it could be offloaded. So we'll get in more into that in detail. So we had two shell handling positions uh, that stood here. Uh, one of them was called the tray man, and it was the tray man's job to uh, handle what's called the standing or the dump tray. It's on this other side here. We'll get a little closer look at that in just a minute. Uh, we also had uh, the um, uh, uh, number two shell man who stood here and it was his job to assist the uh, uh, tray man uh, making sure that the shell loaded properly off of the dump tray and onto what's called the rammer tray. Standing behind shell man two and the uh, tray man was the rammer man and uh, he controlled the rammer that was capable of pushing a 1,500-pound armor-piercing shell deep up into the gun breach, through the gun breach. This is the handle he used that uh, he could uh, control it with both speed and, of course, on and off. So that's a rundown of the positions. However, there are a couple of additional spots in this side of the turret that we did not discuss. The pointer and trainer who aimed the gun sat in the forward end of the gun well underneath the barrel. We didn't talk about them since they had nothing to do with loading. You can find out more about them in my video, Battleship Texas, shooting the 14-inch guns the old school way. Now let's run through a loading drill. As we do, keep in mind that while the actions are described one at a time and in order, many occurred simultaneously, so things didn't happen as slowly as you may assume while watching this. So once the gun is fired, the plug man is standing here. The uh, gun has been elevated so the loading platform is down. Well, the gun pointer is going to lower it back into battery position. That raises the, the uh, platform. And in the meantime, the plug man looks over and the uh, handle for the uh, operating handle for the breech plug has unsnapped from under the salvo latch so that it's uh, available to open. So what he's going to do is he'll, he'll start swinging this high note that's up here, he's going to start swinging it down. A couple of things are going to happen. First of all, the, um, there's an, what's called an operating bar that rides in a cam here, and it starts pulling the lock mechanism apart. As it opens up, an extractor pops the uh, spent primer about halfway out. He's going to uh, grab that and extract it. He's then going to swing the breech open. And he's just going to stand back here, but he has the opportunity uh, to kind of look around, make sure that everything's looking good here and, and, and clear. So once the gun's back in battery position and the loading platform is in position, the first and second loaders uh, step on, onto the platform. The first loader, as I said before, is the gun captain. I'm in his position here. The second loader is over on the other side. So the uh, plug man is in the process now, and, and he, as he starts pulling the handle down and that breech plug starts to rotate, what's going to happen is this lever here is going to flip this air valve open. And what happens is, this is the gas ejector system, and it shoots highly compressed air up through uh, openings that are in 
the, uh, the threads of the screw box. And this compressed air then shoots up into the bore of the gun and into the powder chamber. There's an incredibly important reason for this. After a gun has been fired, before the breech plug is open, there's unburned, highly flammable, and also superheated gas is still up in that barrel. If you do not have the gas ejector system, when this plug rotates and starts to open, fresh air would rush up in there and it would ignite those gases and it would cause a flashback that would enter the gun house, uh, very likely seriously injure if not kill gun crew. So in order to keep that from happening, that compressed air blows up in there, it ignites those gases, also helps ignite any possible burning residue in there and pushes it out of the gun barrel. So as it swings open, the gun captain's going to look up in the bore. He's going to look and make sure there's no smoke. He's going to, make, he's going to look for any kind of burning particles, any residue that's in the powder chamber where the powder bags are going to be sitting. If everything looks good, he turns the compressed air off and he yells out, bore clear. With that, the uh, two well men, the two uh, powder men that are in the gun well down there, uh, kicks, uh, uh, opens up the, uh, the powder scuttle that leads into the side pocket where the two powder men that are in there will then start pushing four bags of powder out. And so now that powder is, is available. Now at the time, that while the uh, first loader is doing that, the second loader is also busy because he's standing here and he's going to first of all look at the threads on the plug, make sure that there aren't any burrs or any problems there. By the way, first loader, after he clears the bore, he's also doing a quick check of the threads in the screw box, making sure they're good. But the second loader is also going to look at this portion on the front of the plug that's called the obturator. The obturator in this portion of it is made up of two pieces. There's the mushroom that's out front here. It's a rounded portion of steel, and when the gun fires, the pressure of it pushes back against this gray and green band that's called the gas check. The pressure from that mushroom squeezes this uh, gas check out and squashes it out, and it seals around the uh, back of the barrel, and that's what keeps 36,000 pounds per square inch of hot burning gases from shooting between the threads and out into the gun house. So he's satisfied that it's good here. Uh, he's making sure the threads are good. Gun captain's happy. So at this point, the first and second loaders grab handles that are on each side of this portion of the loading tray. This is called the platform tray, this uh, section. They're going to grab it. Now, I'm going to just move it some. I'm not going to try to swing it down. It's far too heavy for one person to operate. Anyway, they're going to grab these handles. They're going to swing it down, and they're going to lay the nose of that platform tray up into a cleared area that's in the screw box. This provides a nice smooth platform and bearing surface for that 1,500 uh, pound projectile to slide on when it's ran far up into the, uh, into the bore. The, um, then that also provides the platform for uh, uh, moving the powder up into the breech once the, uh, once the shell has been rammed. We're going to use an animation for just a moment. Once the platform tray was positioned in the gun breech and the crew was clear, the rammer man used his control lever to ram the shell deep into the gun. It not only had to be pushed far enough in to make room for four powder bags behind it, its drive band located close to the back of the shell had to engage a centering ramp at the forward end of the powder chamber. This gripped the shell to keep it from sliding back when the barrel was elevated, and it provided a proper seal to keep gases from shooting forward past the shell when it was fired. He could tell that it was properly positioned when a friction clutch on the rammer slipped, indicating that the shell couldn't be pushed any farther. Once the shell was rammed, he retracted the rammer and was prepared to assist the shell man and tray men with ramming powder bags if necessary. So reaching on the other side of this uh, projectile, we could see what's called the standing tray, or also called the dump tray. Dump tray is a really highly descriptive word that works very, very well for this. When the uh, shell came up through the, uh, to the top of the, uh, the hoist, it would actually rotate uh, on a cradle to where it would tilt backwards enough to where it would slide out onto this tray. Now, people have asked, how could these guys possibly heave a 15 or 1,275 pound shell around? Well, it was actually pretty simple. What's difficult to see right now is that this tray is actually kind of tilted back so that when the shell lands on it, 
it wants to stay back toward the back. It doesn't want to roll over onto the rammer tray. But this is where the, uh, the uh, tray man comes in because once this shell has been rammed and whenever they call for another shell and it comes up, he actually has a knob here he can push. And when he pushes it, it kicks a prop out from under and that tray just moves down that much. That's just enough to tilt this tray toward the rammer tray and then the shell can be easily rolled uh, by both the uh, shell man and the, and the uh, tray man onto the rammer tray. As soon as the weight is off of that dump tray, it, it would actually pop, it doesn't want to pop in these days, but it would pop back up into position and be ready for another tray, or sorry, for another round. Now once the shell has been round, uh, rammed up into the breech, uh, most of the uh, gunnery manuals printed uh, during different years for this turret uh, said that the uh, dump tray or the standing tray was to be raised back to its storage position. Now I don't think they did that for reasons that we'll cover in another thing. I, t I think that while ever the turret was ever in action, they actually left this tray down. But in any case, if they were to raise it, uh, there is a small latch underneath uh, that the uh, shell man he could sw uh, swivel a little lever up, and then, then that's the stowed position for that tray. Nonetheless, the shell's up there, and now it's time for the uh, powder passers or the two loaders to get to work. I'm currently standing in the number two position. On the other side, uh, one of the well men has set a powder bag up on the loading platform and it's, it's uh, set up there with the uh, handle or the cloth handle facing up so that the powder man can grab it, tilt it up and pick it up and he's going to set it on the tray with the red patch which is called the ignition patch facing aft. He's then going to shove it as far up as he can into the breech. That's uh, from the number one loader standing on the other side. At the same time, this loader is going to reach down and the other well man is going to do the same for him. He's going to set that uh, powder bag on the tray. Uh, this guy will grab the handle, tilt it, lift it up, and he's also going to set it up on the, uh, the what's called the platform tray. He'll t turn it so that that red ignition patch is facing out, and then he's going to shove it as hard as he can up in there. In the meantime, the uh, tray man and the uh, shell man standing farther back have a wood ram rod. They're going to use that rod and they're going to push and he possibly even be assisted by the two loaders. And they're going to shove those two powder bags as far up into the breech as they can, hopefully right against the base of the shell. Now once that's clear, they're going to, to uh, do it again because it took four powder bags, or what are called sections, to, cre to create a full 420 pound charge. So once again, the number one loader on the other side picks his second bag up, he sets it down with the red patch face in the rear, pushes it as far as he can, and then again this loader is going to pick up his bag, set it on the tray, and push it up. Now this time, the, uh, two, the two guys, uh, the tray man and the uh, number two shell man, will push it up, but they're going to be directed by the uh, first loader because they want to stop the back of that last bag just inside of, I don't know if you can see it, but there's kind of a bevel area there at the gun breech. He wants to stop that bag right there. And the reason for that is once they close the breech plug and, and lock it in place, that's going to put that red patch right against the face of that breech, club, breech plug. And that's important because that's going to put the flame path through the uh, primer vent when the gun is fired right up against that patch. So the projectile has been rammed up to the forward end of the um, powder chamber. Four bags of powder have been loaded in and it's now time to close the breech plug. So the plug man swings it shut. The uh, second loader will very likely push and help him close it and he's going to start to rotate this lever up but he's only going to rotate it part of the way. What happens is that uh, breech plug rotates and is almost fully locked but not quite. It's at this point that it's time to uh, load the primer in there. Now, up until this point, the gun's been relatively safe, uh, but it's now about to become a whole lot more dangerous. 
He's going to reach down, down here where my hand is, is a wooden block that uh, a bunch of live primers are sitting in. So he's going to take one out, he's going to lean across and insert it into the, uh, into the lock. Once he inserts it, at this point, the first and second loaders are off of that uh, platform standing back here. There's no one uh, on the platform or anywhere close to where the breech might hit them if it accidentally fired. Even if it did fire, the uh, plug man might get knocked around a little bit, but probably not seriously injured. Anyway, the, the uh, primer is inserted. At this point, he's going to fully swing the, the uh, operating lever up, and the end of it's going to latch under the salvo latch. At that point, the firing lock is fully engaged. The uh, handle's locked to where it cannot be reopened, and the gun is ready to fire. The uh, first loader, or gun captain, then orders the second loader to, switch, to indicate that this gun is ready to fire. My hand, I think it's out of this up view of the camera, is on a safe ready switch. It's been in the safe position. Second loader switches it to ready. That tells the uh, turret commander in the uh, booth that this gun is ready to fire, but it still has to be aimed. So down below, uh, underneath the gun, where the pointer and trainer are, they're getting busy. They bring the, the uh, turret, the gun on target, they hit their ready switch. Same thing's happening over in the right hand gun sleeve, and once it's uh, fully ready to go, they have their ready lights on. This tells the commander that this turret's ready. He switches his ready light on, which tells the, uh, them down in main battery plotting room that this turret is ready to fire. Once everything, uh, once they're happy with the turrets that they're going to fire on that salvo, then they're going to hit the firing key and the guns will fire. In the meantime, once they've hit that ready switch here, the crew up here has absolutely no idea really when the gun's going to go off. So they're just uh, kind of hanging back here. The gun, by the way, has elevated so that the, the breech and the loading platform are down out of the way. But everything else can actually, short of loading the gun itself, can be uh, going on. They could bring, be bringing more shells up ready to load and that kind of thing. So that's the uh, basic loading order for this gun. Now one thing that's easy to assume but isn't really true is that things happen one step at a time. You do one thing, then you do the next, then you do the next. Well, that's certainly true of some operations. For instance, nobody can do much of anything until the gun has been cleared by the, uh, by the gun captain and ready for loading. While the projectile is being rammed, uh, there's not much going on there then. But as the powder pad loaders or the uh, uh, number one and two uh, powder men are heating bags up, other things can be going on. For instance, uh, up here, the uh, hoist man is going to use this telegraph to signal down to the, uh, to the uh, uh, shell deck that's uh, below us to, to hoist a shell up. Because even though I said before they might raise the, uh, the dump tray out of position or back to its stowed position, why would they want to do that? And in fact, there's one gunnery manual that suggested you leave it down. Because you've already rammed a shell up, the rammer tray is clear, the dump tray is clear. So let's get ready for the following shots. While they're doing all of this with the powder bags, another shell comes up, tips back, and slides out on the dump tray. To even get farther ahead in the game, the, uh, the uh, tray man may uh, go ahead and hit that plunger and drop the dump tray to where that round rolls out onto the rammer tray, ready to be rammed. As soon as that, that round clears this hoist, the, uh, uh, the uh, hoist man uh, hit, switches to lower, the uh, hoist man uh, below uh, drops the shell car back down where they'll actually begin loading the next shell onto the hoist. Now, they will leave, at that point, they will signal up. They can also use this voice tube here and talk directly to him and let him know that the shell is, uh, down there is ready. Even if that gun has not fired yet, they may bring another uh, shell up and drop it onto the uh, dump tray. Now with that, they have not only a shell in the breech, they have a shell sitting on the rammer tray and a shell sitting on the dump tray. All of this can happen independently of everything else that's going on here. That allows them to get ahead of the game. This is one of the things that, uh, that 
really helped them reach that 45 second firing rate even though this is an incredibly manual system. Now the last thing is even if they have a shell in here, two shells sitting back here ready to be loaded, he's going to send that, uh, that uh, request that the, uh, con the guy controlling the hoist down below send the, the shell car back down and put even another shell on that car ready to go. That just cuts a few more seconds off of it. So you can see what they've done is they've loaded the pipeline with shells.